ever played a game with the crazy amount of details yet running butter smooth? Most people will probably attribute this to hardware, but that would be a disservice for all the people that have implemented awesome techniques that will stand the test of time. So here are genius graphics optimizations you need to know. Be sure to stay until the last point, because I've gone through more than 20 frame analysis of well-known games and all of them has implemented this well-known technique. But let's first start at the top with Frost on Culling, one of the simplest but might as well be one of the best optimizations out there. Our view as a camera is a pyramid with its top chopped off. This is called a frostum. Inside this frostum we check against the bounding boxes of each object and if it's not inside and it doesn't intersect we don't have to render the object at all. Occlusion Culling works by determining if something is occluded by another object, if a camera can see an object or not, by it being blocked by another geometry. This can be done on both GPU and CPU, but most simply, it's by having a low poly version of your model and doing ray versus triangle on the CPU. Front to back and biggest bounding box rendering. Another simple trick we can do is render things front to back to minimize overdraw. Overdraw is the issue where we render the same pixel multiple times, but it's going to be discarded because it's occluded, so it's wasted memory. One thing that people don't think about that much when having distance-based fog is that you can do a lot of tricks with it. One of these is just to bring the far plane closer to you and try to align it with the 100% density of the fog. Instancing is the act of trying to group together multiple things into one draw call. We do this by sending up the model to the graphics card once, then we call draw instance with how many instances we have, and we also have per instance data, which is transformation for each of the instance. And then by the graphics API already implementing this, we get instancing. A non-built-in version of this is batching. Instead of relying on hardware, we take all of our model's data and put it together into one big model. Then we just render this one big model, just like per usual. Dynamic terrain tessellation. If you want to have a smooth terrain, you need it to have a lot of vertices. But this is not scalable if you have a huge terrain. This is why we can dynamically do level of details around the player. The closest section to the camera has the most amount of vertices, and the ones further out have lower. Having realistic lighting and material interaction isn't really an optimization, but how we do PBR definitely is. Because of how many tricks we use, it should really be called approximated based rendering. Things like microfacets simulating bumps on the surface, Schlick's uh, Fresnel approximation, the ambient light just being a coefficient and not having 100% energy conservation. Image based lighting, one of the simplest way to simulate global illumination, GI. Take a screenshot in the world in a cube-like pattern, we call this a cube map, then have it have a position in the world, we call this a probe. Blur the cube map, it's not really how we do it, but it's just a simpler way to do it, and then we apply it when we do rendering. Spherical harmonics or light probes. Having multiple light probes and storing them inside spherical harmonics. Just like the previous point, we want global illumination, but now we want it locally. So let's say we have green grass, we want the wall next to the grass to be green. Therefore, we place more than one probe in the scene, but this is very inefficient because of the cube maps we will store everywhere, it's just so many textures. And that's where spherical harmonics take place. It's just a way to store the cube map into formation in a way more efficient way. Just like GI we store probes, but they are blurred, we can also store them unblurred, and we can use this for reflection, and that's called reflection probes. Planar reflections is also a great way we can do reflections on flat surfaces like mirrors and on water. You essentially render the whole scene from the plane's point of view, but you can run very simple shaders and low res. Light mapping, a very fast way to do static global illumination because we pre-compute the lighting and store it in a texture, also known as baking. Each object gets an index or a UV that corresponds to the slot and the texture when applied in shading. Photon mapping simulates GI in scenes by saving light hits, photons, on the surfaces, and then using them to approximate the light calculations later. It's a great optimization because it simulates how light would interact in the scene and how caustics would bounce in the scene without ray tracing. Voxel-based global illumination. 
approximates GI by dividing the scene into 3D cubes, voxels, and storing live data inside of them. This method is faster than normal ray tracing because instead of doing it per pixel, we can do it per voxel. Screen Space Ambient Occlusion, or SSAO, is a great way to fake shadows in places where light would never hit. It simply checks how much the pixel is surrounded by other geometry and take the estimate of that. Deferred Shading is a great way to optimize light calculations. Instead of doing normal light calculations, we render the geometry to specific render targets like albedo, normal, roughness, metalness, etc. We then use the render targets, also known as the G-buffer, together with the light data and do them all together in one place. Light prepass. Traditional deferred rendering, just like I said, separates the rendering into two different components, the G-buffer and the lighting calculations. In contrast, light prepass instead just calculates the light directly and then we just have that texture, so we get away with some data that we don't need in the G-buffer. This means that the G-buffer becomes smaller. Acceleration structures or data hierarchies. Acceleration structures is just a fancy word for a data structure where we can look up things fast. There's no way I could fit them all in this video, but I'll just mention some of them fast. Bounding volume hierarchies, KD trees, OC trees, BSP trees, and grids. Tiled rendering. If grids are cubes in 3D, tiles are the same but in 2D. We split the view into tiles, and then we have the lights intersect with the tiles, and if it intersects, we just put it in that tile. This is really fast because we isolate the lights into different regions of the screen. Clusters, also known as forward plus. Clusters is the big brother of tiled. Tiled is in 2D, covering the entire screen, while clustered is in 3D, covering the entire frostum. The exact same technique is used here, but now instead we can use the light's actual world position and position them in a cluster. Another fast way to get away with not doing ray tracing is screen space reflections. It's almost the same, but it works on screen space and uses the G-buffer when doing path tracing. Pre-computed radiance transfer. Commonly used in subsurface scattering, pre-calculates how lights interact with different material properties using things like, we said before, spherical harmonics. By pre-computing this data, we don't have to do it in runtime and we can just sample from a texture when doing the shading instead. Stencil shadow volumes. Project silhouette of an object onto the stencil buffer. It worked quite well for hard shadows, but it cannot do soft shadows. Popularized in ID Tech with Doom 3. Shadow Atlas. This is a must if you want to have per light shadow casting. Shadow atlases are usually constructed in a way that the lights that's closest to the camera have the highest resolution in the shadow atlas. And the further away they are, the lower resolution they get. Cascaded Shadow Maps. This is having multiple shadow maps with a varying amount of size. We have the highest resolution of the shadow maps closer to the camera and the lower resolution going further away. This really makes a difference when we have large viewing distance and can see shadows far away. Variance shadow mapping. Store two depth values for each pixel. The mean depth, which is the average depth from the view, and the variance, which is the spread of these averages. This allows you to filter shadows using hardware techniques like MIP mapping and anti-aliasing, reducing the need to do depth comparison and filtering like PCF. Resources. MIP mapping, a very essential technique used everywhere in the pipeline. Essentially just storing lower resolution versions of the same image. Texture channel packing. A way to think of a texture is not an image, but more of a data structure where you can store whatever you want inside. An example of texture packing is just storing the X and Y component of the normal and then computing the Z component using the cross product. If we also have things that are either on or off, we just need one byte, so like metal, and therefore we can pack these together into one channel and then we can bit shift wherever we want into the texture. Bindless resources. We want to send as little data as possible to the GPU. So what is not a better way than to just send it up once and leave it there? This is exactly what Bindless Resources does. 
We instead have an index we send up and say where in this resource we want to sample from. This can be used on textures, models and other resources. Mega textures. Mega textures are kind of what they sound like. It's an insanely large atlas. This can example be all the albedos in the scene or all the metalness or all the normal maps. This helps a lot with performance because just like with bindless resources, we don't have to bind this all the time. Resource streaming. Another way to not send things to the GPU unnecessarily is just sending things that are visible for us. So when moving about in the scene, resources will be swapped in and out depending on what you see in the scene. Sparse virtual textures. An extension of the two previous points is sparse virtual textures. This is where we can have a large atlas like a mega texture and just load in parts of it depending on where we are in the scene. Optimizing models. A simple way to optimizing that is often forgotten because of new tech is just simply to optimize your models. Having less triangles is always better and having your own format like a binary format is just way better in all different ways. Level of detail or LOD. Level of detail also known as LOD is a way we can have different detail level of example a mesh change out in runtime depending on for example view distance. Usually we have different models we can choose from with varying amount of vertices with the last one just being a plane and this always points towards the camera and it's a billboard also known as an imposter. Dynamic LODs also known as virtual geometry and by unreal standard known as nanite is also a way we can do LOD but dynamically but it has its drawback as well. Code and shader optimization. Caching. One way we can really help out the GPU is just by not using it. Caching is the act of saving things and reusing them instead of recalculating them when we don't need it. For example, this can be UI. Minimize state changes. Much like using bindless resources, minimizing state changes is a great way to optimize. If we group together things that has the same stage, we only need to change state per group instead of per object. Branchless shaders. By doing less if statements, you not only reduce compile times, but also reduce branching in your shader. Branching is when we can't deduce the output to one thing, but it's either or. This is bad because it reduces parallel efficiency. And since pixel or fragment shaders run on per fragment basis, it's a lot of branches. Ray marching or even ray tracing can be really expensive against complex geometry. So how can we solve this? This is what sign distance field is for. We just simplify the shapes. Compute shaders. GPUs are parallel processing machines and are really efficient with it. So some things are really good to send up to the GPU to calculate. But there's one issue with this. Threads really don't have a good way to talk with each other. So for this reason, there are a lot of things that we cannot do on the GPU. But particles are often an exception to this because they usually don't have to communicate with each other. Asynchronous compute. We can take advantage of the fact that low level graphics APIs enables us to asynchronously queue different things like render, copy and compute. This enables us for example to render the scene as per usual on the render queue but also copy resources from the resource queue like streaming in textures but also doing compute things so calculating particles and physics on the compute queue. So everything is very asynchronous. Temporal reprojection. Temporal reprojection is a technique that uses information from the previous frame to improve something this frame. Often used in anti-aliasing with things like temporal anti-aliasing, TAA. But it's also used to stabilize the images and optimize things that would otherwise take a lot of computation. And when mentioning anti-aliasing, we cannot skip over FXAA. Although maybe not the most elegant solution, it's very fast and it does its job. It smooths jagged edges by analyzing the contrast between neighboring pixels. Hierarchical Z buffer or high Z. Used as an optimization for a lot of different techniques like screen space reflection and ray tracing. You essentially create a MIP chain of the depth with varying resolution. Depth peeling. Almost like high Z, 
but instead of storing different resolution of the depth, you store different depth slices, just like a 3D texture. Bitwise transparency and alpha stripping. A fast way to calculate transparency is not doing it at all. Transparency means full opaque or full clear, and translucency is where some color goes through. We can discard clear pixels, like in foliage, with using alpha stripping, which just removes the pixels in a checkerboard pattern-like way. This is really useful for distant objects, and it can also be smoothed out with post-processing. Logarithmic and reverse depth. Both logarithmic and reverse depth take advantage of the fact that floating point precision is higher towards zero. This helps a lot with Z fighting, but it also gives us a more accurate depth buffer, which results in us having better culling and less overdraw. And the most well used graphics optimization that everyone uses is depth prepass. This technique involves rendering the whole scene, but only with the depth, minimizing and almost eliminating any overdraw. Because we render the whole scene, it's not always an optimization, but in cases like AAA games, where each pixel does a lot of job, it can be highly effective. Even though hardware plays a big role in optimization, without techniques like these, we would be nowhere. These genius graphics optimizations are just a handful, and there's so much more, and each time you delve deep into a new topic, you will find endless of them. But the best way to understand what and how graphics optimization works is by understanding the graphics pipeline. That's why I recommend watching this next video that covers just that in depth.